Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm Lynn Foster, a master naturalist and also the current vice president of the Arkansas Audubon Society, which is a different association than the National Audubon Society, uh, but both are alive and well in Arkansas. I'd like to welcome you to this latest webinar in the Naturally Arkansas series hosted by the Central Arkansas Library System. And I would like to thank CALS for your support of Naturally Arkansas. So um, let me go ahead and uh, power up the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm hoping that everybody can see it. Um, my chat has disappeared. I'm not sure how I can get it back, but I will get it back at the end. Oh no, I see the chat, okay. All right, great. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about bird migration, um, how it is so dangerous and what we can do to protect migrating birds. If I can get this to move, there we go. Um, right now, birds are migrating to their nesting grounds. And um, in the fall, of course, um, they're migrating away to their wintering grounds where they'll stay during the winter. Why do birds migrate? Um, they are migrating now to take advantage of the insects, plants, and nesting locations that are available here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, some are migrating to Arkansas and they will summer here and nest here and others are heading north. They have wintered here and they are going further north to breed uh, up in the Northern United States or Canada. The brown creeper is an example of the latter. Um, around 350 species of North American birds are long distance migrants and most birds migrate at night. Most birds migrate and of those migrating birds, most migrate at night. Billions of birds migrate across the United States in the spring and fall. And you can see the figures there for Pulaski County from last fall, the two peak months of migration, September and October, we had over 70 million birds migrating through at night. And of course, not all birds do migrate then, some migrate during the day. Um, Arkansas has perhaps more than its share of migrants because of the Mississippi on our Eastern border. The Mississippi Flyway is a heavily traveled route for migrating birds. And we also have abundant cover and food for birds on the flyway. The big woods in Arkansas that are on the White and Cache River basins cover more than half a million acres. And they are the second largest contiguous stretch of forest in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the only larger uh, forest area is in Louisiana along the Atchafalaya River in Louisiana. So we're prime migration territory for birds passing through. And this little magnolia warbler here is an example of a bird that does not nest or winter in Arkansas, but it flies through our state in the spring and fall. And actually warblers are some of the most endangered migrating birds these days. So this slide kind of speaks for itself. What are the biggest threats to migrating birds? And let's actually look down at the bottom at that last statistic um, before we talk about the, the, the threats themselves. Uh, several years ago, a, a number of groups cooperated in a study that revealed that since 1970, a little over 50 years ago, almost one in three birds 30%, 3 billion birds have disappeared 
um, in North America since 1970. Um, so this is a number of great concern. Um, we obviously can't continue to sustain this amount of loss or we will soon be without birds. Um, but what are the causes of these disappearing birds? Um, and what are the threats during migration? Well, the indirect threats are loss of habitat, and most of that is to development, and climate change. Um, loss of habitat is caused by urbanization and cropland expansion. Uh, some examples of climate change being a hard on birds are false springs, and we had a false spring here this spring when a lot of plants started to bloom, a lot of insects came out, and then it got quite cold. Um, also heavy rains. Um, so this loss of habitat and climate change are, are huge contributors to that one in three birds figure. Outdoor cats are also huge contributors. Um, these are not only feral cats, but pet cats who, um, who are outdoors. And they are responsible for at least 2.4 billion kills of birds each year in the United States. And, and that's generally considered to be a, a very conservative figure. Window collisions, and we're gonna talk about the numbers uh, on those in a minute. And um, window collisions also are related to light pollution because we have found that light pollution is connected to window collisions. And birds not only collide with windows, but they also collide with automobiles, power lines, communication towers, and wind turbines. Um, although you notice that wind turbines is, is the least of these. Um, and I've tried to give you the sources of all of my statistics on each of these slides. And I'm also going to put my email address um, in the chat before the end of this program. And if you are interested in kind of a summary of a skeleton of this presentation with all of the sources and statistics, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to email it to you. So how many birds die from collisions with window glass? Um, the the um, kind of the a foundational study on this was done in 2014 by uh, folks working for the Smithsonian. And they came up with the number of between 365 million and 1 billion birds each year die in the United States. Now that was in 2014 and the median was basically 600 million. Since 2014, there's more glass, there's been much more development. And so that number is undoubtedly bigger today. Notice that um, almost as many birds die from collisions with residences as die from very tall buildings. And you know, we might just think intuitively that it's the skyscrapers that are the problems, but we would be wrong. Um, it's almost half and half. And so the conclusion that this study came to is that building collision mortality is one of the top sources of direct human-caused bird mortality in the United States. And this, this, these species also came out of the 2014 study um, and, and they are ranked not only according to absolute numbers, but also um, given the, um, the number of species for in, that exist for each of these um, categories. And so notice that um, hummingbirds are particularly vulnerable. And what I've done here is only listed the ones that um, are resident in Arkansas, um, either part of the year or all of the year. So we see that hummingbirds, buntings also, and these are listed in decreasing order. So, um, so the species most at risk is actually ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, but going down the list, we see some other uh, familiar birds. If you have a yard and you feed birds in your yard, um, painted buntings, brown creepers, gray cat birds. Um, and another study was done 
Um, and this was a study of uh, collisions with tall buildings in two major cities, Chicago and Cleveland. Most of the data came from Chicago and it was over a long period of time. Um, and this study revealed that certain species were um, what could be regarded as super colliders, that they died in much greater numbers than others. And all are birds that vocalize as they migrate at night. And this was thought to be a key factor in, um, in their deaths. Um, White-throated sparrows, a, a common winter visitor. I've still got some in my yard. I don't know about you all. Uh, song sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, the same. So why do birds crash into windows? Um, we, of course, know what glass is. Um, and birds don't see the glass. They either see the habitat or other things on the other side of the glass, and they don't know that that glass barrier is there, or they see habitat reflected by the glass. Um, I'm sure all of you have been outside your houses and you've looked at the glass and you see a reflection of the sky or trees outside. Well, that's what the birds are seeing and that's what they think is there. And so, um, as you know, if, if you've ever dealt with this, birds fly into glass and they'll either die on the spot or they'll fly away and pretty typically die soon afterwards. Birds, birds' eyes, most birds, are on the sides of their heads. They have excellent peripheral vision, but poor depth perception, unlike us. And one thing that, um, that research makes clear is that lights at night distract and disorient migrating birds. Um, it confuses them, it exhausts them, and it makes them vulnerable to collisions with buildings, not to mention other urban threats. And I don't know how many of you have seen the, the kind of poignant video of the 9-11 Memorial in New York City, which is uh, very strong beams of light shooting up into the sky. And um, unfortunately, birds become trapped in that light and researchers have observed them circling around and around and around in the light until they become exhausted. And so now what they do is when they notice this, they contact the managers of the lights and the lights are turned off for a short interval, allowing the birds to move on out uh, before the lights are turned on. And so, um, so light definitely is, is a factor in all of this. Um, night lighting we know will cause birds to deviate from their routes and um, the amount of light is a, a better predictor of mortality level actually than building height. And um, fog or a lot of clouds increases the danger of light because the birds will fly lower and the refracted light is visible over even a larger area. So there are two significant types of collisions. Um, in the daylight, the birds are going to crash into windows either because of what they see on the other side or because of the reflection that they see. But at night, most of the crashes occur because nocturnal migrants are flying into lighted windows. There is a third type of, um, not, not really a collision with glass, but um, well, you could call it a collision, and that is that birds attacking their own reflections in windows, and I'm thinking of a cardinal in my front yard who one year uh, pecked at his reflection in the window for hours, hours, hours on end. Um, but the first two types are the ones that are significant um, in number. So if birds are not seeing the glass, if they're not seeing the windows, how can we help them? What can we put out there that they will see? And um, here is the latest scientific consensus. You may look on the internet and see that you can put up elements separated by four inches in vertical columns. That has now been changed. And the rule is two inches by two inches. Um, and that picks up hummingbirds who typically 
are less than four inches uh, in wingspan. So elements separated by two inches in horizontal rows and two inches in vertical columns. And this needs to be on the outside windows. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we could stick these things up on the inside of the windows? Unfortunately, inside of the windows don't work. Um, and ultraviolet light has come along recently as a, um, a possible um, aid in preventing bird collisions. Um, most birds see ultraviolet light, um, but not all are sensitive to the same degree. Um, I have been trying to find a definitive statement as to whether there are actually birds that do not see ultraviolet light at all. I haven't found a statement like that, but there are several statements that some species are much more sensitive to it than others. So songbirds, gulls, parrots, <clears throat> and, and quote other birds, unquote, that's not real helpful, are sensitive. Um, raptors, kingfishers, hummingbirds, um, pigeons, and American woodcocks are less so. So kind of taking a step back here, how can we help um, birds who are migrating um, and birds in general? Um, we can monitor migration, and I'm gonna talk about that. We can plant native plants um, so that we're basically kind of restoring habitat for migrating birds that has been taken away. We can keep our cats inside. We can treat our windows and we can keep our lights out. So let's just kind of go through these. Monitoring migration. What are we talking about here? Um, Birdcast has been on the internet not too long, uh, several years, I believe. And what the Birdcast folks do is they use weather radar to monitor and forecast bird migration during peak migration seasons. Birdcast only operates, I think, for um, between about, oh, four and six months out of the year. It's not up all the time, but it comes on during peak migrations. I think it started on March 1st this year, and it's gonna run until June 15th, and it will come back in the fall. It estimates the number of birds that are now in flight um, on any particular night, their direction, speed, and altitude. And this is a sample screen from a, uh, a bird cast monitoring screen on uh, March 3rd, a couple weeks ago. Um, and I think this is probably Pulaski County. It doesn't say what it's for, but most likely I typed in Pulaski County. So you can see it's going to tell you there's approximately the number of birds in flight, which direction they're going, the speed, the altitude. Um, most birds fly between 100 and 10,000 feet above the ground. Uh, most birds um, begin to fly within 30 to 45 minutes after sunset, and they fly typically uh, two to four hours after sunset. But there are lots of exceptions to these generalizations. Now, this is an email from BirdCast. I'm actually signed up to get their emails, and you can sign up too if you're interested. Um, and BirdCast will email me on the nights that a particularly large number of birds is going to come through. Um, the BirdCast model predicts high intensity bird migration over your region. Large numbers of birds will be flying and it tells me what to do. Between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., turn off my exterior lights, close curtains or blinds, avoid illuminating lobbies, plants or fountains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm told that in some places, the weather forecasters will alert people um, when they forecast uh, on the nightly news on TV. Uh, and include this as part of their forecasts. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that here in Little Rock? If any of you know any weather forecasters, let me know. And this is actually the forecast for tonight. Um, and you can see that even though we are during, uh, we are in migration season right now, 
the forecast is is not very high for birds migrating tonight. There's no migration alert. Some cities actually monitor um, bird cast, and on the nights when there are migration alerts, they turn off all lights in government buildings. Um, so you know this is one way to respond to bird cast alerts. And uh, another way to think of this too is on the nights when there are high migration intensities, you're gonna see more collisions. So this not only forecasts the number of migrating birds, but it forecasts collisions as well. So the more birds moving at night, the more collisions we're going to see the next day. So planting for birds, um, what did they eat before our feeders and mealworms that we put out for them? Um, well, flowering plants produced seeds, trees are hosts to insects, um, shrubs and trees produce berries uh, for the winter time that birds eat then. Um, few birds like hummingbirds uh, will drink nectar from plants and are actually pollinators. So we can plant for birds in our yards and help them from starving to death on migration, especially in areas where there is a lot of development, where areas that they used to come to are now barren of natural habitat and food for them. And I'm actually involved in a couple of um, discussions with a couple of groups right now, I'm not going to name them, about some development going on in the Little Rock area where habitat is very rapidly disappearing. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's not going to be good for the birds. And at this point, um, I'd like to just um, include a little message from CALS. Uh, there's going to be a plant sale talking about plants you can plant for the birds. Um, native plants are the best. And you can find out why that is. You can talk to experts about planting native plants and you can buy plants at the Cal's Native Plant Sale, which is gonna be on Saturday, April 27th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, I will be there as will some other people. Kevin Crager from the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission is going to be speaking about creating a bird friendly yard. Um, he is on the uh, Arkansas Audubon Society board. Um, he's uh, got a huge amount of knowledge. We're going to have several speakers on plants, a couple speakers on gardening. So it's going to be a really great event. Um, you can skip the speakers if you want and just go straight to the vendors and buy plants from them. We're going to have uh, eight or nine local plant vendors. So if you want to look at the plants before you buy them and talk to somebody about them, ask questions about them. This is the event for you. So now keeping cats indoors, um, there are over a hundred million feral and outdoor cats in the United States. And remember the number of birds they kill is 2.4 billion a year. And this is generally regarded to be a conservative figure. So what can we do about cats? Um, we can spay and neuter feral cats. Um, I've heard that they're working on an injection that will spay and neuter feral cats. That would truly be a wonderful thing. Don't cause cats to become feral. Um, keep your cat indoors. Build a catio. Um, walk them on a leash if your cat has to be outside. And this is actually a photo of my cat who I've had for a little over a year now. She took up residence in my yard. And after several months of um, seeing her, I finally decided that she wasn't gonna go away. So I trapped her and um, I'm not sure what her origin story is, but she is the sweetest gentlest animal. Um, I knew nothing about cats, had no cats in my life prior to her. Um, I, I don't think she's feral because she never acted in, in any way like feral cats supposedly do. But um, a success story, cat brought in from the wild, no longer threatening birds. 
So um, window treatments. This is, is kind of the heart of things here. Um, and I'm hoping that at the end of this session, you all will um, contribute to the chat. And if you're using something really effective on your windows, let everybody know. And we'll go through the chats and see what everybody has to say. So again, I'm going to start with the most effective window treatments. And uh, people agree that exterior window screens, like used to be on all windows, at least where I came from, um, you can't really improve on them. They're great, they're safe for birds. The bird will just bounce off the screen. Um, so window screens are the best. Unfortunately, not every window can handle a window screen. Um, also very, very good are um, what's colloquially known as Zen curtains. And they, these are simply, I'm gonna show you a photo of these. These are simply parachute cords cut up and hung from the top of a window. Um, <clears throat> you can spend money and buy a kit from Acopian Bird Savers, and I've given you the uh, URL here. Or you can, like I did, just go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, buy the parachute cord, cut it up, and tape it to the top of your window with a really, really strong tape. And I did that six years ago. The tape is still holding, and I had had a couple of collisions uh, on those windows, no more. Uh, they've really worked great and I highly recommend them. Um, netting also works. If you're going to use netting, um, the openings need to be half an inch or smaller and they need to be stretched very tightly across the windows. Otherwise the birds are gonna just come through the netting and, um, and collide. Uh, an example of netting, um, last week um, I had the privilege of being at Rose Sanctuary in Nebraska, which is a sanctuary for the sandhill cranes that come through there every year. There are about a million sandhill cranes that come through there. And um, they're expanding their building, which is why you can see all this stuff in the background. But notice the windows. There's netting on those windows. And they've had that netting for years. It's, it is highly effective. So if you can put something like that on your windows, that is great. So we've talked about um, screens, Zen curtains, and netting. And, and all of those are outside of the window with a little bit of distance between them and the window. But there are also things that you can put on the windows that directly attach to the windows. And the first of these is bird tape or bird film. Um, and it basically just gets stuck to the outsides of windows. And there are some, there are a number of companies that sell these and I'm sticking to the ones that have been around the longest and also provide the most information for you on their websites. Um, Feather Friendly Tape has been around for quite a while. Um, the American Bird Conservancy, which is a, um, a nonprofit that does a lot of research on birds and is dedicated to helping birds, used to have its own bird tape that you could put up on windows. And now Feather Friendly Tape sells that for the American Bird Conservancy. And anytime you see the, uh, the the word ABC in this presentation, it stands for American Bird Conservancy. So American Bird Conservancy used to sell this themselves, now Feather Friendly Tape sells it. And this ABC bird tape is also available from other sources as well. You can get it at Walmart. I don't know about our Walmarts here, but it is available from Walmart online and other sellers also. So um, this is, this is feather friendly. Um, it's called Melody White. I'm not sure why it's called Melody. I think maybe that refers to the dots. Uh, just guessing here. Um, and you can see a window with it on the window. That's film that's covering up that window. And you can see a, a, a person putting it on her window. Oops, sorry. And this is about six inches wide. So it's tape, but it's very wide tape. 
Um, Collide Escape also makes um, tape and screens that uh, their screens appear to be opaque, uh, but you can see out of them on the inside. Um, and they sell dot and pattern tape very similar to Feather Friendly. Um, both of these companies will also um, sell uh, their, their wares in very large quantities for commercial buildings. And Kaleidoscape will send you free samples um, if you pay for the shipping. And then a, a third company that, that is um, very big in this market is Solix um, Films and their email address is, or sorry, their URL is decorativefilm.com. They sell 48 inch wide rolls and they will send you free samples. So all of these stick directly to the window. They have to go on the outside of the window. Um, and uh, they are generally viewed to be quite effective. Um, okay. Also effective are um, decals. Um, as long as you have something every two inches. And usually the way this is handled is by putting dots or other, um, other shapes every two inches. So um, Window Alert is a company that sells these decals and dots. Um, and lately, uh, glass manufacturers have started making fritted or etched glass. And this is glass with little um, embedded um, or etched patterns, dots, squares, whatever in it. Um, and they, um, they don't affect viewing all that much and they're very visible to the birds. So this is probably not gonna be feasible for your home unless you just happen to be replacing all your windows. Um, but it is something to consider when a new building is being designed and constructed, definitely. So this is what uh, one example of what fritted glass looks like. Um, mixed effectiveness is um, ultraviolet treatments. Remember um, back at the beginning, we said that birds can see ultraviolet in varying degrees. And so um, some folks have started manufacturing decals that have ultraviolet in them. And also uh, this is a little photo of a marker, a liquid marker kind of, you know, like a magic marker, only it's bigger. And um, you can make dots in between the decals with this ultraviolet. And so there's a little, uh, uh, a little picture here. What we see over on the left side is nothing. And what the birds see is um, on the right side. And it's very visible to the birds, hardly visible at all to us. Um, I say mixed effectiveness because um, there is some evidence that UV doesn't work as well as the film or the, uh, the curtains, the screens, etc. cetera. Um, when I was at Roe Sanctuary last week, I talked to somebody from Audubon Great Lakes, and she said that they had been using ultraviolet, but they were replacing it with film because it wasn't as effective as they had hoped it would be. <clears throat> Here's an example of some glass. This is called Ornelux glass, and it's made by the Arnold Glass Company, which is a German company. And um, to us, it looks clear, but on the right side, you can see what it looks like to birds. And um, they got their inspiration, their website says they got their inspiration from the orb weaver spider. So this does not look like an orb weaver's web to me, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> so um, two, two drawbacks to ultraviolet. One we've already talked about. It's not known whether all birds can see it. Um, some species seem to be less sensitive than others. And two, the ultraviolet should be fairly bright. And that may not be the case depending on where the window is in relation to the sun. Now, at Rose Sanctuary, they have used ultraviolet um, in a very successful manner. 
Um, they had cables that extend out over the Platte River, which is where the birds roost at night. And birds colliding with the cable, uh, and this is just power line cables, birds colliding with the cable were a big problem. So they installed ultraviolet beams that beam out along the length of the cable. And that has cut back on bird mortality by 88%. So what I predict happening in this area of ultraviolet is that we're going to see um, more research done on bird sensitivity to ultraviolet. And we're gonna learn more about birds. And we're also gonna learn how to use ultraviolet better and it will become a, um, a much more used and more successful way to prevent collisions. Um, this is from um, the American Bird Conservancy Bird Friendly Building Guide, which is a pretty lengthy pamphlet. You can download it off the internet and I've given you the link at the end of this presentation. Um, and they did a little bit of a, a cost effectiveness study here on different types of um, window treatments. Um, I don't see Zen curtains in there, but uh, they did cover most other things. Um, the Bird Friendly Building Guide is from 2015, and it mentions ultraviolet a bit, but not extensively. I um, posted a a question to Arkansas birders on the R-Bird listserv. And if you are interested in birds and have never heard of the R-Bird listserv, um, go to rbird.org. That's the website of the Arkansas Audubon Society. And look down uh, in the, uh, the bottom line of links and you'll see one to the R-Bird listserv. And it's a terrific listserv birders from all parts of the state are on there. There's lots of discussions going constantly about birds people see, um, what to do about all sorts of different things, first of season emails. Um, somebody today posted that they saw their first hummingbird in their yard. I'm still waiting for mine this spring. Anyway, um, I posted a question and asked told people I was doing this presentation and asked them if they had tried window treatments and and how the window treatments worked for them. And I didn't hear from anybody who said things did not work, but I did get, um, as you can see, a handful of responses. And um, one person said they had window screens. Um, three people, and I'm including myself in here, um, had Zen curtains that work. Um, two people used window tape and put it up in lines um, and they worked and somebody used uh, tape with dots and that worked for them. So if you are having a problem with bird strikes and you use any of the effective methods, I think you will find that you will see um, the situation greatly improve. So what is ineffective? Well, um, Somebody um, puts a hawk decal up in their window. Oh, the birds will be frightened. They'll see this and they will stay away. <laughs> That's not the way it works. The birds will see that shape and they will know not to fly into the shape, but all around it, they can see space. And so a decal by itself or decals that are spaced more than two inches apart will not be as effective as if you follow the two by two rule. Also, putting uh, anything inside your windows is not going to be helpful um, because the birds can still see through the, the windows. Maybe you're blocking that view with a shade or something, but that's not going to affect the reflection that they may see on the outside. So to make the window treatments effective, remember two by two and remember um, exterior and not interior. So coming to the lighting issue, um, and, and the lighting issue is kind of mm, not as clear cut as the window collision issue. How, how exactly does lighting um, interfere with migration? How does it exacerbate collisions? 
Um, it's really hard to come up with exact numbers for this. Um, Lights Out Heartland was formed several years ago. There is a national Audubon Lights Out movement and Lights Out Heartland includes the states in the Mississippi and um, central flyways. And Arkansas, of course, is one of those states. And so this is a really handy website to go to and it's got lots of information for um, avoiding light pollution and keeping your lights out to protect birds when they migrate. Lights Out Heartland um, forms partners. They have two types of partners. One is institutional partners, uh, Arkansas Audubon Society and the Arkansas Natural Sky Association are both partners with Lights Out Heartland. And they form business partnerships with specific buildings or, um, or entities like a campus. Um, and those buildings agree to follow certain rules for their, for their lighting at night. So these are some lighting guidelines for commercial buildings. Um, turn off lights from 11 p.m. till 6 a.m. Turn off your non-essential lights. Um, turn off your interior lights as much as possible. Any decorative lighting, turn that off. Um, be sure that outside lights are aimed down and well shielded. Shielded lights can do so much to prevent light pollution. And it, at home, um, if you're gonna have outside lights, install motion detector lighting. Um, yellow lights are less harmful um, to wildlife than white or blue lights. Um, shield the lighting, point it downward so that it's not going up into the sky, confusing the birds and pull shades and curtains, et cetera, so that your interior light doesn't show. And um, last <clears throat> and least, uh, because not much has been done in this area, um, are laws and policies, standards, guidelines, et cetera. Um, in, uh, I looked, I'm gonna talk about the second one first. Um, there's a, a bill in Congress right now, um, House Bill 3781, and it would require federal buildings or buildings um, built with significant federal funds to, um, to follow, to obey certain standards with respect to bird safety. Um, it was introduced in 2021 also. I have been told that there's little chance of it passing during this Congress, but if you're so inclined, this would be something to write your um, congressional representative and senator about and urge them to pass this. Um, the, uh, the lead standards are also um, standards that affect buildings being built. They're not mandatory, they're voluntary, but a number of public buildings and even some private buildings um, are starting to be built according to the LEED standards. And LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Um, LEED is a private association. It's not part of any government. Um, <clears throat> um, but sometimes there are requirements that buildings comply with LEED standards. And there's information on both the American Bird Conservancy website and the Kaleidoscape uh, website about uh, their film, their products, and its relationship with LEED. So if you're interested in that, that's where you should go. And um, let me just talk about uh, these sources for just a second. Um, BirdCast has some really informa really interesting information. Remember, that's the monitoring and forecasting service. That's the first source listed here. Um, there's a video by Scott Loss, who is a professor at Oklahoma State University who does research on bird window collisions. And um, it's a little short on the management, but he's got a lot of science in there about how they monitor 
bird collisions and the more recent information that they have found out, it's, it's pretty good. Um, the Bird Friendly Building Guide uh, issued by American Bird Conservancy, I've already talked about, it's good. It also does contain a model ordinance for bird friendly construction. Um, and the last two here are um, publications by Jim Kuby. And he has um, a kind of an interesting theory. Um, and, and I just, I wanna share it with you tonight because I think there is some merit to it, but I also disagree with it in part. Um, he says, forget the lights. He says the lights are not important. He says what is happening is that birds stop along their way when they're migrating and they may stay at a place for a couple of days before they move on. Um, and so during most of their migration, they're actually stopped along the way eating or resting. Um, and he says, when they come to these stopping places, which many of them are in our yards, they run into our cats and our untreated windows. And so he says the three things that are most important to migrating birds are providing food for them, taking care of the cats, getting the cats out of the picture, and treating the windows. Um, I, I disagree with this be because, um, particularly in big cities, um, I think that lighting is, is a huge issue. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of that story. Um, I think it was from last fall uh, in Chicago, um, which is my hometown, so I'm always interested in stories about Chicago. Um, a whole bunch of birds collided with the glass in the McCormick place um, because people weren't being good about the lights. Um, and hundreds of birds died in one night. So um, you do see this in big cities. But also, even that aside, even out here in the boondocks in my house, I keep my exterior lights off at night always. <clears throat> and it's a little bit for the birds, but it's also for the other wildlife. Um, we know how night lights affect insects very badly. Um, they distract insects from going about their business and mating and doing things like that. Light pollution is really hard on wildlife. So that is a, an unrelated reason, but a very good reason to watch your night lights and not let them be a problem. But he also has done a cost-effectiveness evaluation of different, um, different uh, window treatments. So uh, that's also a good place to go if you're interested. Um, there's another handout for bird safe buildings um, that's produced by the New York City Audubon Society. And um, it is titled Bird Safe Building Guidelines. And um, this is my email address. So if you want, this is going to be posted, this uh, presentation is going to be posted by CALS um, on their YouTube channel. But if you want just like a, a, a handout, um, I'm going to put one together this weekend. So shoot me an email and I will send it to you. So um, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now um, because it'll be easier to see the chat. And there's the chat. OK, so um, do screens on windows keep birds from window strikes? Yes. Um, oh, I didn't give the place of the plant sale and Mark Christ posted it. Thank you, Mark. It's gonna be at the Children's Library, which is 4800 West 10th Street in Little Rock, uh, close to UALR. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Window alert decals on Amazon show them being placed on the inside of the window. Will that work? If the birds are, what I have read is that if the birds are coming to your window because something they see on the inside, they will work. But if they're colliding with your window because of the reflections on your window, they will not work. Um, they will always work if they're on the outside of the window. So I would argue just put it on the outside of the window. Um, if a hawk decal 
doesn't work, would an actual 3D decoy of a hawk in the window divert birds? Uh, well, I don't know how easily are the birds fooled. Um, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Haven't come across that. I, I just really can't answer that question. Um, let's see. Um, Jack Stewart. Hey, Jack. Um, is telling everybody about the Arkansas Audubon Bird Friendly Yard Certification. And let me just throw in a, a, um, a plug for that while I'm at it. Um, Arkansas Audubon Society um, has a lot of information on its website about how you can make your yard bird friendly. And um, this is a, a kind of a self-certifying program. So if you apply, and you can apply by going to our website and following the instructions, and that's ourbirds.org. Um, we will, um, you can see the questionnaires online, you fill out the questionnaires, you send them in to us, you can do this electronically, and we will evaluate your questionnaire. And if your yard is bird friendly, I think we have two categories right now. Tell me if I'm wrong, Jack. Um, working to become bird friendly and bird friendly. And in either case, you can get a signage for your yard that says that. Um, and uh, and that's um, very educational. I have heard that if you have signage in your yard about why you're growing natives and the fact that you are growing natives, that there are fewer neighbor complaints. Um, so, uh, and, and also signs are very educational and they can start conversations with your neighbors. Um, thank you for the reminder about insects, lightning bugs need darker environments. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, Jack is saying that Arkansas Audubon bird friendly yard folks will also provide you with in-person advice. If you have any questions about it, just shoot them an email. So, um, we've still got eight minutes to go. Um, I tend to talk fast when I do these things, sorry. Um, but thanks to all of you who, uh, who came tonight, uh, please come to the native plant sale. It's really going to be good. And it's a chance to meet these vendors and ask them questions. And they are really a source of a huge amount of knowledge about these plants. We'll also have some experts there to talk about more general things, planning for birds, planning for butterflies and bees, um, how to buy native plants, what are these things called cultivars, are they good or bad, all sorts of, of really good knowledge, lots of exhibitors from state agencies and other nonprofits, and lots of handouts. So mark your calendars, April 27th at the Children's Library, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I think I'm done for the night. So uh, have a good evening, everybody.